Well, let's go ahead and uh, get into our study. Let's get into Ephesians chapter 6. We will be uh, beginning a new section here uh, this morning. And so before we do, uh, you know, by way of review, as always, um, you know, we didn't have, we didn't meet last week as it was uh, Resurrection Day, right? Super Bowl Day and uh, Super Sunday for uh, for believers as we celebrated. And uh, so we didn't have uh, our meeting here last week. And so it's been at least two weeks uh, for some of us since we've been in the book of Ephesians. But just remembering that, uh, you know, the, the latter part of chapter 5 and getting into the early part of chapter 6, you know, the last you know, several weeks we've been talking about um, relationships, you know, and, and how the Lord has called us to love one another, to submit to one another uh, in our reverence or in our fear and our submission to Christ, that he's given an order in all these things. And so Paul points to that and gives examples, right, in the household relationships. And uh, I remember thinking of husband-wife relationship, uh, thinking of parent-child relationship, and then we talked about the master-slave relationship, which really, you know, we would tend to think more of like the employer-employee relationship, and and just how we are to, um, you know, conduct ourselves. How are we to live in each one of these um, roles that we have? Because some of us play, we have multiple roles in this, right? You may be a mom. Uh, and a wife and an employee, right? Or a dad and a husband and an employee or, or whatever it is. And so that's the key. It's not an exhaustive list. He's just using a list here to say, here's some examples and really the primary ones because it's in the home, right? So it all starts there. Uh, but, you know, as, as we're um, serving in the church and as we're, you know, out in the community and doing things, we're called to, to conduct ourselves in a, in a manner that is, uh, you know, thinking back to the Sermon on the Mount, that we're called to be salt, the salt of the earth, and we're called to be the light of, uh, in the world. And so, you know, he's really been expounding on that and unpacking that and remembering uh, as he closed out in verse 9 saying, uh, even to the masters, yeah, that you're over somebody, but you're not to be lording it over them, uh, kind of the same way for husbands, wives, right, for, for parents and children. Uh, but there's a, a, a way to understand that uh, all of our master is the same master, uh, and he is in heaven, and that's who we're serving. And so we need to do that to the best of our ability uh, and beyond our ability, you know, if possible, that he would strengthen us to do that uh, in whatever capacity it is that, uh, that we're going to do that. So um, thoughts, um, you know, we're, we're a little bit early. Thoughts or co other commentary to add to that before we uh, start here into, into verse 10 now. And uh, we're really kind of, you know, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel here as we're getting into this last section here of, of this letter. Um, any thoughts of, of that that comes to mind that maybe need to be added? Or anything else that's on your heart in this letter that, that uh, you want to share? All right. Well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get into it <coughs> here, excuse me. And if someone would mind, uh, uh, Jason, would you mind? Um, you usually bring your, your nice big reading voice. Uh, could you read verse 10 through um, 17? We definitely won't get through all that today, but let's just uh, kind of put it on the plate if you don't mind. Chapter 6? Yes, sir. Okay. Six, 10 through 16? Uh, 17. 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flame, flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keeping, keep alert, all perseverance, making the supplication for all the saints. Thank you. And thank you, Father, for this text. Thank you, Lord, for the truths of your word, uh, for the sword of the Spirit that you've given us. And we know this is the word that has saved us, it's the word that sanctifies us, Lord. So we pray that uh, this morning you would sanctify us in the truth of it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so uh, yeah, verse 10. 
I think a lot of us are probably familiar with you know this text, and probably uh, some of us are all of us been looking forward to, to getting there and uh, getting into this. Um, you know, I think of so many Sunday school lessons being taught and being part of. I think of so many uh, you know Awanas that I've taught at and Good News Clubs that I've taught in public schools and you know chapels over at Island Christian School and just so many times that you know teaching and, and talking about, you know, this passage and, and the armor of God, right? And uh, having the, you know, an object lesson for kids and putting on that, you know, chest plate, put on the helmet, grabbing your sword and, uh, you know, just the, but I think sometimes, even as I say that, uh, you know, just this one or other ones, as we teach kids or we do these object lessons or these things, uh, sometimes I think I can get complacent or really not recognize you know, the, the full scope of what is t- being talked about here. Um, you know, that it's fun to do that. Yes, we teach uh, the kids these things, but, you know, that we would really come to an understanding of what Paul's talking about here and what the Lord is revealing to us here through this. And so, you know, it, it starts here. And we know it's the final segment because look at, as he says, the first word there in verse 10, finally. Uh, so uh, I know a lot of you know that when you hear me preaching uh, and you hear, you know, finally, or you hear me saying like, as we close or something like that, it really means that's really the preacher's way of saying like, I've got a lot more still to say. <laughs> so hold on, because I'm just trying to get you to be with me thinking, oh, it's close to ending, but I really got like 20 more minutes. Um, so Paul is is saying, finally, you know, we're, we're here, we're concluding this letter. And now he does so by uh, speaking about this spiritual warfare, okay? So this section, uh, you know, speaks to and deals with um, the reality that there are, uh, look at verse 12, that there are wicked, uh, spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Uh, And so... What do you guys think about when you when you hear that? You know, and, and that's probably as much as we're going to be able to chew on today is maybe 10 through 12. We'll aim for that. So let's not go forward into those next ones yet. Um, but when you hear these spiritual forces and wickedness and heavenly places, uh, what what comes to mind? What do you tend to think of when you when you hear of that? And, and then we'll go back and kind of unpack these couple verses. Thoughts? Frank Peretti books. Do you remember those? No, I, I know who you're talking about, but I don't think I read any of them. Present darkness. Yeah, yeah, that that one. yeah. What was the name of it? This present darkness. Okay. I remember what they were. It was kind of based off of this passage, but it was. Yeah. Yep. Just the entertaining book. Okay. That kind of explored uh, potential realities of the spiritual dimension and what is going on while that we are kind of impervious to or, or uh, <coughs> not impervious that's not the right word uh, but uh, unaware of it's the opposite of pervious <laughs> <laughs> that's so easy uh, one of the things um, Craig, that I you know and, and I was reading in Romans 13 where he talks about the idea that be subject to the authorities and it's something I sometimes struggle with because if the authority he says that uh, there's no authority except that which God has established and yet if if those in authority are doing things that are if you want to say evil <laughs> that are doing things that are against God's word and, and God's will it, it creates sort of a dichotomy he's telling us that you know that we should uh, be subject to that, and and um, if we rebel against that, then um, we'll bring judgment on ourselves. And yet here, he sort of gives maybe an answer to that by putting on um, the full armor of God. Um, Honey, there's one in here. Sorry. Come so I, I I don't know. It, that's yeah. something I struggle with sometimes. So. Uh, um, that concept of of the um, being subject to the the quote rulers or mm-hmm. authorities in this case government whatever and and yet maybe this is there's an answer here okay that, that yeah so kind of a dual application honey there's one up in the fridge here sorry 
Um, so maybe a dual application, right. like I exactly. see you're tying them together, right? right? About the idea of just so we're all on the same page, the idea of Romans 13 submitting to earthly um, authorities that have been established, right. like governments and policemen and those who have been put over us, even pastors or, or whatnot, but certainly in the secular. Right. Uh, but but also obviously back in Ephesians, speaking to the spiritual warfare in these these heavenly places, right? Um, right. Maybe some principles that'll help us in both of those things. Thank you. Appreciate it. So the one thing, as I think about what he says, you know, I think. My thought process goes to the whole you know, trying to wrap your mind around it and being conformed to the authorities, even if it's maybe the proverbial evil force against you, right? This, my thought is, goes to, as you were talking, was Pharaoh, right? Where, where God, you know, hardened Pharaoh's heart. And so Pharaoh persecuted, you know, the Israelites because of a lot of what they were doing was wrong. And so he used Pharaoh in that to be able to persecute the Israelites until he felt it was time for them to leave. So I think for, in our finite brains that we can't quite um, you know, understand and, and, and realize the vast and the understanding of God and what he does. But, well said on that part, for yeah, sure. <laughs> but I think that kind of helps to understand a little bit about us being persecuted, you know, even under w- whichever administration or whichever city council or whatever the case may be um, to, you know, not necessarily accept it, but understand it and, and realize that. But then the second part of what I kind of have to say is then the wicked and evil forces in the heavenly places. So most people think that heaven is this awe-inspiring, wonderful gold streets and, you know, of that nature. But, you know, so how do you explain the wicked and evil forces in the heavenly places? Okay, good question. Thoughts? Yeah, because this is really you know the heart of what he's talking about these these spiritual forces. Um, you know we're gonna we're gonna get into this, but that's the like saying the dark forces, uh, the angelic realm. You know is is what he's alluding to and talking about here. So would so, that necessarily be like the angelic realm here on earth? So, whereas mm-hmm. God opens the eyes to see all the, you know, his, I don't want to say minions, but his angels of destruction, you know, yeah. for whatever reason, is that kind of what... The yeah, is? so in the scriptures there's actually like three heavens mentioned, um, and uh, you see that in Genesis, and we've talked about that, you know, a couple of years ago when we were in the beginning of Genesis, but the, the heavenly places, certainly, like you said, we think of heaven like God's abode, right? right. And um, Paul talks about that when he says, you know, I knew a man who was taken up into the third heaven. And he's speaking about how he was taken up in spirit uh, to the third heaven. So he says that's the third heaven, meaning there's a second and a first. And so that second, just Cliff Notes version, second would be like outer space and like, um, you know, the galaxies and, and space. Mm-hmm. And that first heaven would be the skies. Uh, the psalmist writes about the birds fly in the heavens um, and things like that. So, so yeah, it would mean in all those aspects that there is, there is this battle that's going on, you know, that, that he says is not against flesh and blood for us as believers. It's against the powers that are in these heavenly places. And, um, and he's spoken of... Uh, of these, this stuff before. Um, thinking back in, uh, I have it written in my notes somewhere here. Um, it's in chapter one, I know. Um, okay, first couple of verses. It says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is chapter one, verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So, you know, he's spoken of these heavenly places before and that we have blessings uh, coming uh, and, and have all these spiritual blessings. But to your point and to answer your question directly, yeah, the heavenly places means all of that uh, in this world that we live in. God bless you. Um, and, you know, and we even see to to a degree up into a certain time point that Satan has access to some degree to the third heaven because in Job and in Revelation we see Satan before God, you know, 
testing or, or trying to accuse, I should say, uh, the brethren. He, it says he's before the throne of God day and night accusing the brethren. And then it talks about that in Job, how the sons of God came before God and Satan was with them. So there's even Satan and demons and angels in all of these places right now. Until one day, you know, we know they'll be put in their place and we'll all be in, in our place. So uh, that's a huge, good, good question uh, to understand and wrap our mind a little bit around what that means. I agree with that 100%. I would add, you know, the reference to Daniel, when you see him praying, and you have a description of angelic We could turn battling. there. We're going there in a couple slides, That's if you want to go now. Yeah. Um, you know, so I would, I would view this context uh, in the first and second heavens yeah. of activity. Yes. And, and recall that Satan is even referred to as the prince and power of the air. Mm -hmm. And so... Good yeah. point. And, and you know, angels are different than us in their ability to travel through time and space. And so, yeah, not not so much the third heaven description, but right. definitely activity along in the first and second. Right. Yeah, because this activity is this battle, this war that's going on. And you know, as I think about think about the world we live in, you know, I even see some horrific you know, commercials for movies that are coming out, you know, as you, you're watching TV and you see something, you know, there's all these, you know, they make movies about this stuff. You know, the, the reality of the world's view upon this stuff is, you know, they either discard it or deny it, you know, like there is no such thing as any of that stuff, um, or they even mock it, uh, you know, and take it lightly and make fun of it um, and, and make different movies and different things about it. But, uh, you know, Paul isn't addressing what the world thinks about it. Right? He's writing to believers. Uh, he's writing to saints and addressing it here and saying, uh, you know, we need to be uh, knowledgeable to what degree, like you said, Jason, uh, you know, our finite brains, to whatever degree we can understand these things, we're not to be ignorant of these things because that's significant to, to us and for our sanctification and for, uh, you know, for our, our lives in this um, you know, he makes us aware of the fact that this is where this spiritual warfare he's going to start unpacking happens. It happens in these heavenly places. Um, you know, let's let's go to uh, let's go to one of these at least. Uh, you were referring to Daniel ten, I think, uh, Brian, and uh, but let's go to Second Kings. Um, I know that's a good one that we just read through recently, some of us in our year reading. Uh, I know Jill, this is one of her favorites, um, 2 Kings chapter 6. And, uh, and let's look at this account here. Yeah, it was just a few days ago, actually, this, yeah. this past week in our reading. Is it, I'll put a line mm -hmm. here. Is that the one? Uh, oh, man, that's even, that's even a better one. Let's bring, spirit, bring spirit, that to light also. Yeah, a spirit approach God said... I'll, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll bring a lying spirit. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah, like how are you going to make this happen? Yeah, and he's yeah. like, yeah, go do that. <laughs> yeah, go do that. That'll work. That'll work. Yeah. So, you know, to your point, think about, you know, even talking about the third realm and, and just the dialogue and the things that are happening. You know, that's, I mean, would you consider that a, a, an angel or a demon who's saying that? Right. My question right. is that. It's not a holy angel asking and saying to God, like, hey, how about I go and be a lying spirit to the prophets <laughs> and trick the king and, and we'll, we'll befall him and we'll kill him that way. Yeah. This is a demon talking to God. And God says, yeah, go do that. Yeah. So these are, these are things that when we read in the scriptures, you know, it's like, what? <laughs> you know, the first time you read these things, it's like, what did that just say? Like, is that what that means? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I was trying to, when I read that passage, and that I was like, why would, that's like so unrighteous. Like, why would he do that? But then it, you can't, you can't question God's will on that. Yeah, you know? because he, look, to your point, even about the Israelites, like you're making, that they were in bondage for 400 years. That was for a specific time, and that was to grow the nation of Israel. But also, remember, as they came out and they conquested and, and killed and slaughtered all the people and took those lands over, that was God's judgment that was boiling up for 400 years for the time to be right that he condemned them in judgment. So again, God is God. And, and uh, you know, the more we understand that, the less we ask and question him about how he does things, you know, th I think that comes with maturity. Because, but doesn't mean that it's easy to understand or comprehend. But to your point, as you said, we just have to trust that he is good and he's working it all out. Yeah. 
Um, let's go to this one in Second Kings, um, chapter six, and uh, maybe anybody else want to read for us uh, verse eight to seventeen in this account. And so what's happening here is uh, Elisha is now the prophet in Israel, and uh, and we're going to see that there's the Syrians or the Arameans are in war and they are trying to capture Elisha and see what happens um, here. This is a, a just a remarkable thing. Um, I can certainly do it if nobody else wants to. Or I can make Brian do it. <laughs> I can request Brian to do it. Oh. That's okay. You're looking at other stuff. I got verse, yeah, no, I'm there. Uh, verse 8 uh, to 17, if you don't mind. Okay. Second King 6. Once, when the king of Syria was warring against Israel, he took counsel with his servants, saying, At such and such a place shall be my camp. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are going down there. And the king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God told him. Thus he used to warn him, so that he saved himself there more than once or twice. Okay, pause. So everybody get the picture here? Israel is at war with Syria. The Syrians are trying to attack Israel, and Elijah is being told by God what their plan is, and he's warning them. Right, and so the king's getting mad here, and let's see what he does. <laughs> Excellent intelligence officer. Yes. Uh, and the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled because of this. Yeah. Thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me who of us is for the king of Israel? Mm. And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. <laughs> and he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and seize him. He just told him, Behold, he is in Dothan. So he sent their horses and chariots and a great army, and they came by night and surrounded the city. Now, when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Mm -hmm. The Syrians came down against him. Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, please strike this people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. And Elisha said to them, this is not the way. This is not the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he led them to Samaria. Thank you. Okay. Thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, I remember reading that the first time I read that. Uh, was like, wow. Like, just like we were talking about the one you just talked about with the lying spirit. Um, this is an amazing thing, right? That Elijah says, hey, uh, Lord, would you grant, I think this is Gehazi, his, his servant here, and would you grant that he would be able to see so that he would not fear? Uh, you know, as I say, uh, those who are with us are more than with them. This guy's got to be thinking, like, dude, they got a whole army out here, and it's just me and you. <laughs> and and then the Lord opens his eyes, and, and, you know, behold, there is, you know, a mountain full of chariots and horses and warriors, you know, with a flaming fire. Uh, and so he was able to see, you know, the, these, uh, think of the God of angel armies, right? Uh, the, the, Lord of, the Lord of hosts, that's what that means, the angel armies. Uh, so he was able to see some of this angel army. Uh, and just, can you imagine, can you imagine seeing, you know, something like that? Um, I'm assuming his fear probably dissipated really quickly, uh, but he it, it was in awe, a different type of fear probably came upon him. You know, um, so, you know, all that just to kind of point to the reality. Uh, so, you know, if we have thoughts and maybe, you know, you haven't uh, studied angelology or maybe you haven't uh, read through these passages and, and studied and considered these things, um, you know, we can certainly have some dialogue around that and, or questions and, and discussion. Uh, but Daniel 10 uh, is another one. Actually, if you want to turn there, we won't read the whole chapter, but... I'm going to turn there just to kind of give you bullet points if you want to go there. Daniel 10 is one that I think will tie in Jason's thoughts and will definitely tie in Greg 
uh, some of the things you and, and Jason were discussing there about who's in power, who's in authority, who's even here in earthly authorities. Uh, and, and I would say to you that that is tied directly to spiritual forces and spiritual authorities. Uh, and the reason I say that is because of Daniel chapter 10. Uh, Daniel is, has a dream and he is terrified. Uh, the context is that they are in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. The, the Israelites will be there. Uh, Daniel is, is given great knowledge, we know, by the Lord. He is given the ability to interpret dreams. Um, you know, the Lord does magnificent things to protect him and his friends and to use him, exalts him, so, similar to Joseph. He comes up to be, you know, kind of second in command in this place, uh, gives him favor uh, with Darius and, and the leader uh, and the king there. And so there's all these things happening. And here he's given a, a vision or a dream by God, and, and he is confounded and, and, and uh, you know, confused. And then he is comforted. Uh, look down at verse um, 11, because a messenger, okay, or remember what's the word that... Uh, the Bible used typically for a messenger? What, what, what was that called? Prophet. No, a prophet would be a messenger uh, because he would have a message from God. But what is the word that is translated as messenger uh, that, that we see in the New Testament a lot? Anybody know? It's angel. So angel, uh, when you see the angel of the Lord, uh, that, and an angel means a messenger. And so he uh, is, is given a messenger, and, and uh, we won't get into all, is this Jesus or not, this messenger. There definitely is the thought that this is a Christophany. But uh, look at verse 11. This, this angel uh, of the Lord speaks to Daniel and uh, says, Oh, Daniel, man of high esteem. And what a, what a great thing, right? That, in other versions, I think, say greatly loved. Maybe some of your versions say that. Oh, Daniel, greatly loved. You know, greatly loved by God, greatly esteemed by God. Understand the words that I'm about to tell you. So what's happened is it's been 21 days. Daniel's been fasting and not eating and praying to God. And this messenger comes and says to him, uh, do not fear. Since you prayed that first day, I have been coming and planning on coming to you to give you understanding about what it is that troubles you. And so he comes with this and look at verse 12. He says, from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and humbling yourself before God when he prayed. Your words were heard, and I have come in response. Verse 13, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia, and I want to just point out here, as Brian said, one of the names for Satan is the prince of the power of the air. This is speaking when it says the prince of the kingdom of Persia, similar to angel being a messenger of God. Prince here is referring to a prince in the spiritual realm that we're talking about. This is talking about a demonic uh, spirit. This is talking about when it says the prince of the kingdom of Persia, this is talking about an evil, wicked spirit and a, and a demon was withstanding me for 21 days. And then he talks about how Michael the archangel helped him. And so uh, he was, uh, you know, withholding this demon of Persia. And at this time, uh, you know, there was Babylonian captivity. Now, excuse me, I said Babylonian captivity for 70 years, which that's past. Now Daniel, uh, who's in authority when Daniel is there, is the Medo-Persian Empire. So it's the Persians who are ruling the world, if you will, at this time. So he's saying there is this prince of Persia that I was battling against when I came here. And the Persians are the ones who are now controlling the, the world, if you will. Then as he closes this, he gives Daniel a little insight about what's happening and the timeline about their, you know, their release from captivity. And now look back at verse, look down at verse um, 20. After he says these things, he says, Then he said to Daniel, Do you understand why I came to you? But I shall now return and fight against the prince of Persia. So I am going forth, and behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. However, I tell you what is described in these words of truth. Yet there is one who stands firmly with me against these forces, except the Michael, your prince. So look at what he says. Next, after I fight this prince of Persia, the prince of Greece is coming. If you know your Old Testament history, which is history, world history, um, and where these two combine and collide, which they always do, the next power was Greece. 
Okay, the Greece Empire came in, defeated the Medo-Persians, and in that intertestamental period where our Old Testament ends, and remember when our New Testament picks up, who's in power at the time of Jesus in the New Testament? What's the governing authority? Rome, okay? Um, so from Daniel and the end of the prophets here, it's, it's Medo-Persia, but then we know between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's roughly 400 and some years and in that time, Greece became the dominant power, which leads to actually why your New Testament was originally written in Greek, because the majority of the world spoke Greek because the Greeks were the ones in control. And so I lay out all of that now to say questions, thoughts, comments about this whole ball of wax. You know, that definitely could be, uh, you know, a lot of information there to say this text leads me to an understanding that there is a spiritual battle going on all around us all the time that we are unaware of in the sense of we don't witness it we don't view it we don't we don't get updates on the briefing or on you know uh, on headline news about uh what is happening and the next demon that's to come uh and who's going to be an authority and who's going to control this but if you see what i'm trying to say is everything we have happening here in our reality is being affected directly by this spiritual realm that is all around us that we don't get to see. Does that make sense? Comments? Questions? And what strikes me is that the question that uh, I've come away with is then, in that case, what is, what is strengthening me? What mm. is strengthening me? Because I noticed in both of those... Um, areas of scripture what was what was coming to assist was Elijah as the word of God so it, so what was strengthened in that the word of God came and Amen. that's what strengthened it. and the same with Daniel representing what came to his what came to the assistance was God revealing, God mm. giving his, so, so what is strengthening you when you're in these encounters? It's the, the word of God and not your good intentions or not uh, the things that eventually will fall apart. Yes. Yep. Preach it. Well said. Yeah, that's right. And, and even back to our text, you know, as that wraps in and ties into verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord. Yeah, be strong in in the Lord. Um, and, and we'll unpack that a little bit more probably next week as I've got a couple points of application for us in these couple first verses that we probably won't get to. Because um, this is, you know, this is really laying a little foundation here. It's, it's important for us to understand the context of what he's talking about. And I think we've seen at least three that I can remember here this morning uh, kind of helping us unpack what that looks like. You know, and even think of the book of Revelation where John has revealed so many things uh, in the heavens and about angels and about them singing and even a song that we're going to sing this morning, Holy, Holy, Holy. And the, the angels are singing that in the heavenly places right now, you know. And so uh, just that reality that we really don't, I think, consider or think of very much. We get tied up in our own world enough that we don't even think about each other and about other things here. I think even way more do we not think about the spiritual forces of darkness and good fighting on our behalf and all around us. And then, you know, to go back to Greg and Jason's comments about, you know, the leaders that we are interacting with on a daily basis and the spiritual influence that they are under, mm -hmm. you know, it does help you when you understand these things to step back and say, okay, you know what? There's not a huge need in me getting super upset with yeah. this particular council member because for all I know, you know, you asked me to read First Kings 22 where the prophet Micaiah saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. Hmm. And I bet those are two different categories, right hand and left side. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab, which was a wicked dude, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said one thing, and another said another. 
Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord, saying, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, By what means? And he said, I will go out and will be a lying spirit hmm. in the mouth of all of his prophets. Yep. And we know who a liar is and the father of all lies is, of course, Satan himself. And so, you know, God says, um, he said, you are to entice him and you shall succeed. Go out and do so. Hmm. Um, now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all, the, all these your prophets. The Lord has declared disaster for you. So, yeah. I mean, obviously, Satan is the instrument. Right. Uh, Satan is the secondary cause. Right. Satan is guilty of the rebellion, of the sin. And God's not guilty of those things, but God is sovereign over all events. And so, that will help you to fulfill the New Testament uh, commandment to do not grumble or complain about anything. Because there is a sense in which, at the very worst case, you could say, well, this is terrible, but God is sovereign over all of this, and his decree is being accomplished. Yeah. So I am just to praise the Lord, I am to walk in righteousness, and I am to trust him and praise his name. Because even though this appears to be a mess, he's still working all things together for his glory and our good. Yeah. But he does show us this is evil. I mean, we are granted over and over to recognize that. Yeah. Yeah. Over and over. Yeah. yeah. And given the spiritual eyes to recognize and, and it. And to resist it. And yeah. to fight it. And to stand for the truth. Right. Which we have from his word, which is our only encouragement. And to your point, you know, we know we're not getting daily updates on the news about the fourth dimension and what's going on. But, but to your point, well, we have all the updates we need. We have the entire yep. story. As you pointed out, well, Daniel got to know who the next empire was before anybody else right. knew that it was going to be the Greeks who are going to take over next. And so the scripture is full of all we need to know yep. about this life. That's right. And what we're to do. And and we've been given, you know, even to add on to the next one, you know, we've been given revelation of what we've been given. And so we know how, you know, we know the trajectory and the direction it's going. And, and we're looking for that day, for that time. And so to some degree, we've been given those, uh, you know, instructions. And so, you know, I love the application, you know, you get there, Brian, of, yeah, we shouldn't allow these things and you know i hate this president i did this and this is your fault and all these things that we can do and post and blah 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 because ultimately we know who is the one controlling every single thing in all of creation and when we really truly believe that then you're right we we don't complain we don't fear we don't be concerned we we be educated, like Elaine said, we've been given this knowledge, we obey, we be diligent, we pray, we pursue righteousness, we do all those things, knowing that the Lord's working through all of it. Yeah. Good. So this is going on all around us, you guys, all the time. And, uh, you know, we looked at Gehazi and, uh, or the servant of Elisha getting to view that, you know, we see Daniel get an understanding of it. Um, and these demons and these discussions that we have been revealed to us, but all of us who are in Christ, you know, that's that's what Paul's saying is, we're not to be ignorant of these things, and we know which side we're on. Praise the Lord, we're we're on the winning team, right? We're we're on uh, all throughout when we think of movies and even you know think about Star Wars or any movie you want. It's light versus darkness. It's good and bad and and. You know, it just seems like that's the story, that's the movie, that's the majority of these things. Because, you know, that it, there's a reality of that, and if people have that even knowledge somewhere in their conscience, in their heart. But we have a great knowledge and understanding of, of that actual light and the actual darkness because we've been pulled out of that darkness and drawn into the light. And so, um, you know, we know what side we're on, but we need to recognize when we're on the side that means we know who those are that oppose us. There's, there is another side. There is another team that loses and is defeated but wants to destroy us and take us out. Um, First Peter 5, 8, you know, thinking of says, be, be of sober spirit, be on the alert for your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour father of lies wants to devour wants to destroy your marriage wants to destroy your home wants to destroy your church 
this is who him and his minions, to use Jason's word, because uh, I like that one too, that's what they do. That's their purpose. They don't care that they lose. Satan knows he le- loses. He knows this book more than I do. He knows this book more than anybody else in here. Uh, he's known this word since it's been out. Uh, he knows what's going to happen, and his minions do too. They don't care. They're going to take everybody down with them that they can. Uh, you know, this is, it's not like they understand like, okay, yeah, God wins and he's sovereign. I know I'm not really going to be God and he is, so I'm just going to kind of quit and give up and I forfeit. Like, that's not going to happen. He's going to be thrown into the lake of fire by God, <laughs> you know, kicking and screaming, if you will, you know, but um, these are just all the realities um, that, you know, we see in this text and and so maybe closing with a, a little bit of application, um, you know, questions for that maybe. You know, how does, how does this affect you? How does this make you feel? This may be something that you're kind of not familiar with and maybe hearing for the first time or maybe you haven't studied it a lot. But um, how does this, you know, we're, again, we're just laying this base, this foundation. We really didn't even get into these three verses. We'll get into those next week because you really need, I think, a, a baseline. You need an understanding to some degree to start digging into what he's saying and what we're going to be talking about. Um, so how, do, how, does, how do these things make you feel? Or how should it affect us? What are your thoughts? How does it make you feel? Make you fearful, frightened, worried, scared, ill-equipped, inadequate for the fight? <laughs> you know? I take away the, the uh, scripture that helps me grasp that when I am holding fast in 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 an ever ongoing battle I am holding fast that uh, it brings him joy I mean Mm. that he's very jealous over me and and, and, and it brings him joy and that Mm. helps me that helps me a lot Mm. Yeah, trying to be pleasing to him. Yeah, exactly. yeah. amen. Makes me grateful. Just makes me think how grateful I am on this side. How grateful that he's given me this warning and this book and this, you know, guidance and direction. Just makes me want to be more faithful. Believe deeper, you know. I yeah, Lord, help me be more faithful. It's convicting too. Yeah, and yeah. Because I think, oh, as we should bring that up. I have so many questions, so it's convicting to, to know and understand it more mm-hmm. so that I can live it. Because how can I live it if I don't? Yeah. So it's convicting. Yeah, good. I think of uh, in Romans 8, where he says, For I'm persuaded that neither mm. death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other created thing should mm. be able to separate us from the love of God which yes. is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that encouragement. Because, yeah, no created thing. So remembering Satan and all his followers are created by the sovereign God who's using them as instruments and tools to accomplish his will, which brings him glory uh, in, in all things. And yeah, listed right in that list, you know, you heard it, the powers, the principalities, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about those things that we're talking about in, in Ephesians 6, you know, those in that in that um, fourth dimension, as Brian called it, I like to call it that too, um, kind of, you know, that fourth dimension that we don't see, you know, typically, unless obviously the Lord grants eyes as he did for some, but um, I would say don't count on that. We just go by faith that this fourth dimension is happening and the things that are happening in it are real. You know, when I think of um, the psalmist that writes, it says, uh, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Uh, you know, meaning that there are, there are, you know, that's where we get the idea of guardian angels. You know, that there are angels fighting for us. There's angels protecting us and keeping us from things. Uh, that's, a, that's just an amazing thing to consider because uh, I'm sure I don't know where I'd be if that wasn't the case. Uh, you know, uh, unbelievable text is Hebrews 1, I think, verse 14, where um, 
the writer there is unpacking and talking about angels and saying, t- pointing to the fact that Jesus is greater than the angels, you know, and a better messenger with a better message. And that he says, you know, about angels, aren't they all just ministering spirits who are going out to minister to those who shall be saved? Meaning that even before, remember that Ephesians 1, Paul says that before the foundation of the world, you were chosen to be loved by God. And so he set forth a time in which that would be revealed to you and you would be saved, though you were saved before the foundation of the world. But in our timeline and our mindset, whenever that was that I was I was saved, I think maybe when I was around 26 years old or so. And what this is telling me uh, is that there were angels guarding me and protecting me to that day and to that time, making sure God's sovereign will happened and all the stupid things and careless things that I did, he was guarding me and he was protecting me and he was keeping me until that time. So that, as he says in, you know, uh, in, in John, um, you know, Jesus says that all the Father have given to me, I lose none of them. Yeah, he gets all of them. All who will be saved will be saved. His angels, in fact, one of their duties is to make sure they make it to that time. Like, this is just an amazing God. You guys, as I say these things, I'm just like putting myself in awe. Like, this is amazing uh, that these things are real. And so even as believers, I think we can have a tendency to think like, oh, this is all fairy tale. You know, uh, this is a nice, and I don't know about those things. And really, angels are around us. Really, there's demons around us. This is the reality that, our, that the scriptures tell us. And so we want to not be ignorant of these things. And... We want to use them, uh, like you guys were saying, to, to convict us, to convince us, to teach us, to grow us, to give him more glory, you know, um, bringing in that application of understanding that he's in control of all these things, uh, and, and we're not going to be able to affect those things to a degree, but we are to, we'll find out, you know, stand firm against those, those oppos- opposing forces. We're never told to fear the prowling lion. We're not told to fear what it is is happening in that fourth dimension. We don't say these things to cause anybody's anxiety to, to elevate. We say these things to understand by faith that you shouldn't be anxious for anything. But in all things, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make a request known to God. And that you don't, uh, he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and a power and a sound mind love because he loved us power because he is powerful and it gives us the ability to to withstand these fiery darts that we're going to get into and to stand firm against the enemy right so uh, we'll unpack that more next week but uh, yeah thanks for the input Uh, always good stuff always having to stop so so soon it seems to come to an abrupt halt and be like oh it's over um yeah i'd like to talk about this more it's it's uh interesting and, and good Pray, pray that it's uh, edifying for each of us and uh, that we would be able to use it for his glory. All right, well, let us, uh, let us close. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much, Lord, for the text. Thank you so much for the time. Uh, Lord, thank you that in spite of uh, our ignorance, in spite of just the uh, inability of, of us to comprehend eternal things and to comprehend these type of heavenly amazing things we can trust it by faith because you've uh, planted in us this seed of the gospel that has sprouted that has brought us into the light and that we are able to trust by faith because you've given us the ability to do that so god we just thank you for whatever degree it is that you allow us to understand these things uh, that your spirit would cause us to, to grow in understanding, that we would grow to be more like you, uh, we would know more about your ways, so that we would be able to stand firm, that we would uh, put on the full armor of God, that we would uh, understand that we are enlisted in the Lord's army, and that we are called to be warriors for Christ. We pray in Jesus' name.